Thank you, President Biker, for that kind introduction. And thanks to all of you for being here. I am deeply honored and humbled by the invitation to speak to you today. I hope it is one small way that I can begin to repay Kelvin College and the Reformed tradition for all that it did to shape my thinking and my faith. I'm also delighted that the Spoolhof Society has agreed to distribute the book uh, afterwards. Uh, it puts me in the very, it gives me the wonderful problem of not wanting to give away all the good parts of my book before you pick it up. Um, and so I decided that I would restrict myself today to talking about my title, Bringing Heaven Down to Earth. Inevitably, that will lead to me giving away some of the good parts, but hopefully there will be enough that you want to go back and look at. Bringing Heaven Down to Earth, and I would subtitle it, Who's Bringing What? Heaven is not a word that crosses our lips or a thought that enters our minds very often. It comes up in funeral homes, in hospital rooms, but for the most part, the afterlife is an afterthought. Now, if we believe that heaven is our eternal destiny, that's rather strange. How can we afford to marginalize and misunderstand our eternal destiny? That was the question that captured me over 10 years ago as I read Neil Planning's book, A Sure Thing, and following his reference in that book, I then read Richard Mao's book, When the Kings Come Marching In, a beautiful reflection on Isaiah 60. I was transfixed by the visions captured in those books and in those passages of scripture. The visions of the New Jerusalem, of Isaiah in the Old Testament and John in the New Testament. Visions that have yet to let me go. The most startling thing to this day that I encountered in those passages and that inspired my book is how the Bible talks about heaven, especially in the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22. Especially when you go back and compare those two chapters with two earlier chapters, Revelation 4 and 5. In Revelation 4 and 5, after the introduction and the seven letter to the churches, the vision really begins in Revelation 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and there in heaven stood a door open, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there in heaven stood a throne with one seated on the throne. And John describes in such vivid beauty the one seated on the throne and all the worship of all the saints and all the creatures surrounding that throne, and the songs that the 24 elders around the throne join in on. I've come to think of those 24 elders lately as heaven's superdelegates. <laughs> But there is praise and worship going on in this heavenly throne room. And it's as though the sky is peeled open and John can look and peer right up into it to see what's going on. At the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, it is our prayer that in weekly worship, the church can receive nothing less than a Revelation 4 and 5-like gift of sharing in this ongoing praise that is already ongoing in God's heavenly throne room. What a great place to talk about this, because the tradition in Christianity that best captures this, I think, is Eastern Orthodoxy. And I knew next to nothing about Eastern Orthodoxy up until a few years ago, I'm ashamed to say. Uh, and please take Father Daly's word uh, for, uh, for what it stands for rather than mine and listen to his corrections that he makes about the way I talk about it. But as I, as I understand it, worship in the Orthodox tradition is defined as heaven coming down to earth. It's that Revelation 4 and 5 throne room that we break into in some way in worship. When we go into the sanctuary in a little bit, your eyes will be drawn up to this glorious dome over the worship space. And at the top of that dome, the image of Christ ruling over all the earth. And it's as though that dome were a hole poked into that Revelation 4 and 5 heavenly throne room. And we are caught up in through it to share in the worship that is surrounding God's throne. By comparison, I would say that our Protestant worship often is rather plain. But I do have it on good authority. My boss, Dr. John Whitley, says that when John Calvin writes about worship, granted, he was not happy with the way that images and icons were being used at his time, but when he talks about the theology of worship, he sounds almost orthodox when he says that in worship and supremely in the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, 
God stoops down to come and lift us up into his heavenly throne room. That's what happens in worship. So we have this beautiful vision before us, and in some ways above us, of Revelation 4 and 5. But when we get to Revelation 21, we encounter something substantially different. It would be satisfying and acceptable, I think, if the Bible ended by saying, and at the end of time all the saints were caught up into the throne room just as I was in Revelation 4 and 5 and joined in the eternal chorus. That could be a reasonable way for the Bible to end, but it's not what happens. In Revelation 21, we get this instead. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven, and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the dwelling of God is with humans. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. That Revelation 4 and 5 throne room descends to earth. The glory of God's presence that right now the elders and the saints and the creatures enjoy in heaven breaks into creation, comes through the dome, and fills out every last corner of creation and culture. John says, I saw no temple in the city. And you think, well, where are we going to worship? If there's no temple, if there's no throne room, where do we go? He says, because the Lamb, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The heavenly throne room perfectly fills every corner of creation and culture after Christ's return. And the worship of Revelation 4 and 5 fills every last inch of creation. The word temple is a key one, as I've come to think even more firmly since writing the book. I've come across a book by Greg Beale, a Wheaton professor, called The Temple and the Church's Mission. He's gotten me interested in the book of Leviticus like never before. I've linked to a summary, by the way, of his book at my website, and I hope you're interested in, um, in following up on some of these ideas. Beale says, what if we read the biblical story, start to finish, Genesis to Revelation, as the story of God's temple presence? So Eden, the Garden of Eden, was the first temple, and God dwelled with Adam and Eve. And he says Adam and Eve were the first priests, and they were reveling in God's presence. But after the fall, they had to be exiled from Eden. And one of the ways that God accommodates himself after the fall to us, his perfect holy presence can no longer be directly with us. And so he says, set up this tabernacle and then this temple as a little model and a little way and a little place for my perfect presence to make contact with the world that is cursed by sin. And so the priests in the temple are set up, but it's not good enough. And finally, in the New Testament, the word became flesh and it really says tabernacled among us. Christ is the temple. He says, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. And the leaders say, that's a pretty big building. And he says, or he could have said, that's not what I meant. I'm talking about me. And at the crucifixion, the veil of the curtain is torn in two. And then strikingly in the New Testament, Paul says, do you not know that you, plural, collectively, the church, with the spirit dwelling in you, are God's temple? And I told those of you in my Calvin Academy of Lifelong Learning class, that really seems to me like God is lowering his temple standards. The church, in all our flaws, all our weaknesses, all our infighting, we are now that place of holy contact with God's presence. It's startling. But creation, history, finishes with God's temple presence perfectly coming and filling every last corner of creation and culture. So what does this mean for the word heaven and how we think about heaven? Well, first of all, talking about heaven as an actual location of God's temple presence is a temporary, metaphorical way to say that God's perfect, complete presence is, after the fall, after Eden, somehow removed from us. Yes, God is everywhere, but exile from Eden means that God somehow withdraws himself or withdraws us from his complete, perfect presence, and we can no longer see his face. The best way to describe this might be that God's perfect, complete throne room presence lies in another dimension. That's a little too metaphysical for me. I can't figure that out anymore. And that's why, I think that's true of a lot of us, that's why humans and God came up with a way to talk about that reality of God's perfect presence currently in another dimension. And that is talking about heaven and earth. The separation between the creation that is cursed by sin and God's holy presence is 
What if we thought of that separation as a separation between heaven and earth? And it worked well for a while before astronomy. The sky is removed from us. The sky is sort of a veil between us and God's presence. Uh, we dwell on earth. God is in heaven. God even says in Isaiah 66, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. But thinking of the separation post-Eden of God's complete presence from God's good creation is a convenient model for thinking about that reality, but it's only a model. At the outset of the space age, Khrushchev proudly announced that his cosmonauts had come back from space and had seen, quote, no signs of God. Space, by the way, I think is full of signs of God, the planets and the stars. But the cosmonauts had gotten our first actual peak above the sky, looked around, didn't see a heavenly throne room, and thought that it was a great triumph for atheism. We know better. We know better. We're not talking astronomy. We're talking theology. Our, the Revelation 4 and 5 heavenly throne room isn't actually up. And even if it were up above Russia, it'd be below what's on the other side of the globe from Russia. We're not talking astronomy here. God's presence lies in a different dimension. The ancient Israelites, Beale says, had this figured out. Without telescopes, without astronomy, they knew that heaven and earth was a limited model. What they did in the temple was that the inner holy place where the priests were uh, was decked out to look like the Garden of Eden, uh, carved with leaves and trees and things like that, but also decorated to look like the skies, blue curtains, lampstands that represented the sun and the stars. But that was the holy place. Beyond the holy place, in the holy of holies, that place was left mostly empty. And they were separated, of course, by a curtain. And Beale says that's because that curtain represented the boundary between the visible creation of God and the invisible realm of his presence. And so it wasn't really that heaven was above earth, but heaven, God's presence, lay beyond creation. Heaven doesn't come down to earth, it comes into earth. And we don't go up into heaven, we go into heaven in some way. The high priest, only once a year, after elaborate preparation, could enter that holy of holies through the curtain to make sacrifices for his people. And then in the incarnation, the high priest comes back through the curtain in the form of Christ. The incarnation is going through the veil from the invisible to the visible. Laura Smith said in her sermon on Ascension Day, uh, last week at the grave, that when Christ was made incarnate, his flesh was that temple veil, the only boundary between God's perfect presence and God's creation. And now it comes in the Spirit. And this Sunday, we could start our service by saying, welcome to Pentecost worship as we celebrate our ordination into the royal priesthood of Christ through the Holy Spirit in which we are made God's temple presence or to mediate God's temple presence to God's creation. It's a little heavy-duty theology maybe for a worship service, but that's what we're celebrating. And Christ's redeeming action when he comes through the veil is not described best as saving us so that he can drag us back through the veil into his invisible realm as much as an action that allows God to start restoring everything on our side of the veil so that God's presence can return. And so while right now the dead in Christ are brought into that heavenly throne room, outside of their, of their body after it is buried, they're still awaiting something else. They're waiting the second coming, the resurrection of the dead, when they shall be raised and God's presence shall return to all creation. It's a dazzling promise. A local pastor I know says that he now at every graveside service prays, may she rest in peace and rise in glory. Now I use the word heaven in the book in the title, in the book. I'm playing along with this model. And I use the word down in the book. I'm accepting the model as I think we usually have it. And I say that when we think about heaven being down on earth, what we're really talking about when we're talking about eternity is God's presence restored to earth, a new earth, a new creation. So if it sounds confusing to say heaven will be on earth, and if it sounds confusing when I talk in the future tense about heaven will, heaven will be, that's what's really going on. Behind the limitations of our language, the restoration of God's presence 
to God's creation. It was into this eschatological framework that I placed what I learned at Calvin about the reform world and life view. Eschatology is a fancy theological term for a set of beliefs about the end times and apocalyptic prophecy and what do you believe about the rapture and the second coming. But more broadly, I hear the word eschatology to mean cosmic destiny. What is the destiny of the cosmos which God created? And as I was trying to form this eschatological framework at Calvin, I was resonating with so much that was being said, especially from Calvin and Kuiper, that Christ's claim is on every square inch, as Kuiper said, of this creation. Christ's atoning work and Christ's reign is not just over our inner spiritual beings. It is over every aspect of everything that was created. Colossians 1.20 says, Through Christ, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things on earth and heaven through the cross. It's also surprising to me that even when you look at the Bible and consider all the ways that heaven and earth are talked about relating to each other, so much of the motion is downward rather than upward. We think, how can, how can we go up into heaven? But so much of the Bible is God coming down, down in quotation marks, down theologically, not astronomically. God coming down, the descent of the cloud onto Mount Sinai, when Moses receives the law, the descent of the word to the prophets, uh, the descent into the Holy of Holies in the temple, the descent of Christ, the word made incarnate, the descent of the Spirit at Christ's baptism, the descent of the cloud once again on the mount for the transfiguration. And I was struck this past week in ascension worship that even in the ascension there's a downward motion. The scripture says he was lifted up and a cloud came and hid them from him their sight. Not he located a cloud and found his way into it. A cloud came. That's the descending theological sign from the Old Testament of God's presence, of heaven and earth, if you will, meeting. And so we're so interested about what would it be like to go up into heaven, and, and when we die now, we'll, we'll, we'll go up, quote-unquote, up into heaven. But the true action of the Bible is God bringing heaven down to earth. And so that brings me to the second word, bringing. Who's doing the bringing? I can be briefer on this point because the answer is as simple as it always was in Sunday school. It's God. But a reader pointed out to me recently that he wondered if I got it right in my book. And when you receive the book on page 149, make a note in your margin here. It's a crucial point in my book. I say that to live every day in the hope of heaven, eternal new creation, is at least a six-step process. We must recognize the gap between what creation is and what it was meant to be, lament that gap, realize that Christ's cross served to close that gap in part for now and in full eventually in every way, anticipate this by starting to try to close the gap ourselves, be frustrated by our inability to do so in any decisive way, and let that lead us to long for God to close the gap for good with the coming of eternal new creation after the return of Christ and the return of Shalom on the new earth. And this reader said, you said we have to start to close the gap ourselves? It's a gift of the Spirit. And he was absolutely right. And I was trying to think what I was thinking when I wrote that. What Close the gap ourselves. I guess that's how it appears to us now because God's perfect presence is hidden from us. And the point I was trying to make here is the simultaneity of it all. It all happens at once. We realize the gap, lament the gap, try to close the gap, realize we can't close the gap, realize that the gap will only be closed after Christ's return on the new earth. It all happens at once. And all those realizations guard us against thinking that we can bring the kingdom perfectly now before Christ's return. But it's absolutely right. When we say in the current campaign for Calvin College, no greater task, hearts and minds renewing God's world, whose task? God's task. We are grateful receivers and humble, meager, flawed, but sanctification undergoing participants in that task. God's awesome new task of renewing all things. As you might know, neo-Calvinism as a movement sometimes comes under criticism on exactly this point. 
Some say we neo-Calvinists have too advanced a view of our own abilities and our own efforts to bring the kingdom to earth. We've been described as triumphalist. If you saw in the February issue of Perspectives, what used to be the Reformed Journal, uh, the critique by a Reformed pastor, with which I was largely sympathetic, and much more importantly, with which Nicholas Walterstorff in a published reply was quite sympathetic, saying that we have too much faith in our own efforts on this side of the second coming, and also saying that Calvinists sometimes are a little too interested in creation and not interested enough in new creation. Interested in what creation was, but not interested enough in what creation is becoming through the redeeming work of Christ and the work of the Spirit. And that's probably fair. I think that unlike a good house guest, a good inheritor of a tradition should not leave it completely the way he found it. And if I have one hope for the neo-Calvinism that I've inherited, it's that we can develop and articulate and embrace a neo-Calvinist eschatology, or better yet, an eschatological neo-Calvinism that is leaning forward into this kingdom that God is building, into God's new creation work that has already begun and will be made perfect after the return of Christ. Richard Mao writes in When the Kings Come Marching In that he is essentially a reluctant transformationalist. People ask him, what's your view of Christ and culture, which of course is one of the core theological questions for anyone who teaches at Calvin College, as he did. And he said, well, yeah, I believe in Christ transforming culture, but remember, let's not let it get triumphalistic. Remember that we, too, are touched by depravity. We, too, are, being, are in the process of being redeemed and sanctified. And that we, in the words of the book of Hebrews, are called to suffer outside the city because we are awaiting a city that is to come. Just three hours ago, as Sally mentioned, in our last chapel of the year, we surrounded the senior students, the outgoing graduates, in prayer. And my prayer for them was, may they continue to be grateful receivers and humble participants in God's awesome new creation project. The key distinction and the key tension that I bring out in my book is between the already and the not yet. We already have Christ's first coming. We do not yet have Christ's second coming. We already have Christ's defeat of death at Easter. We do not yet have the removal of death from the created order. We already have the renewing work of the Spirit, mediating God's temple presence and Christ's atoning work, but we do not yet have God's complete presence bursting through the dome, through the veil, into all of creation. We already have victory, but do not yet have it fully realized. We already have God's kingdom beginning, but we do not yet have it clearly visible to all in creation and culture. That not yet is what can mitigate against an exalted sense of the already. We await, we await what is not yet. We await the completion of this wonderful project that God has begun and is doing in us. And so may we receive and joyfully and humbly take part in God's creation project, God's renewing of all things, in the eager hope for the day when Christ will return and his reign will be made complete and all creation will once again sing in the harmony of shalom. Thank you.